it's four o'clock and we like to start on time. My name is Lykke Fries. I am the director of Think Tank Europa, usually in Copenhagen. Right now I'm in Berlin. Um, I'm also co one of the co-chairs of the European Council of Foreign Relations and it is great pleasure to have this webinar on the upcoming Bulgarian election, which will take place on Sunday. We have had webinars on the uh, Swedish election and recently also on the Italian election. And we thought it was obvious also to have a webinar on the Bulgarian election because it is a country that plays an important role if one looks upon also the, the present crisis with regards to Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine, but also just in general, it is a country that one looks upon also the West Balkans that we in Denmark sometimes maybe tend not to focus that much upon. So we thought at the think tank Europa that the election in Bulgaria was an excellent opportunity uh, to have a close look at what's going on in Bulgaria, obviously the election, but also the overall uh, situation now uh, with the uh, energy uh, challenges, and you could also say obviously with the overall security uh, situation. Bulgaria is a country where you have uh, quite a number of elections. We also have one in, in Copenhagen, Denmark uh, coming up, but there seems to be um, a little bit more volatility in the Bulgarian situation. But um, to enlighten us on all these uh, topics, I am thrilled to have with me the person that I really uh, think would be the best one for us to discuss Bulgarian politics uh, with. Uh, it's uh, Vesla Chaneva from the European Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, you are the deputy director, but you are also the chair of the ECFR office in Sofia. And you just returned from a... Uh, I think it was seven months you spent as a foreign policy advisor for the prime minister. So you obviously also have uh, yourself there, completely new experience with regards to, to politics and what happened there. So without further ado, let's start. I think we should start with the most sort of provocative and blunt question, Vesla. Why should we care about the Bulgarian election on Sunday? We've just all been focusing so much upon the Italians. So why is the Bulgarian actually something we should watch out for on Sunday? And thanks for doing this. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Luca, and uh, thank you all for taking part. It's really a pleasure for me to be back in the open and to be able to, to talk to people um, freely. I will uh, try to explain this by saying that Unlike last year, let's say, when Bulgaria was, again, uh, as Luca mentioned, having a number of elections, um, it was yet one of the Eastern European countries down there that, you know, people kind of more thought about in terms of, you know, the more the periphery of, of the EU. I think having also had this experience in government. Ever since the 24th of February, Bulgaria became the battlefield of a, of a less visible war. Um, and to me, it was really amazing to see uh, how much the public discourse has been penetrated uh, by Russian influence how much of the energy sector, how much of the defense sector, how much of the security sector, and, you know, making an honest effort to, to be, uh, you know, a proper European in that battle, I think is also crucial, uh, not only for us as citizens of this country, but also, I think, for the EU, because this is, uh, there are a number of countries along this kind of eastern flank, if you want to to take the NATO vocabulary, um, who have been vulnerable in various ways. Uh, and we can talk about, um, uh, you know, Cyprus and Greece. Uh, we can talk also about Slovakia or Romania. And in a way, Bulgaria has become kind of the, the pinnacle of a regional fight also. Uh, we do border both um, Russia via the Black Sea, not directly, but, but still 
the war is 500 kilometers away from our north uh, eastern corner um, and we do border Turkey uh, and from there also the Near East, the Middle East and so on. And so I think in times like this we realize that geography really matters and I have to say this was uh, quite retro but, <laughs> but, um, but it does matter, yes. And if one looks upon the present uh, election, why was it actually called? Uh, it was something about uh, war, uh, oh sorry, weapon delivery was one of the items, or what was actually the official uh, explanation that you have to have this snap election? And it is your fourth election within less than two years, right? Right, yes. Yeah. So, so why was the election called? Uh, maybe just to say that those four elections, now the fourth one happening uh, this coming Sunday, those four elections follow a 12-year rule of uh, Mr. Borisov and his party GERB, um, who have been, if not, let's say, notoriously uh, honest, then at least uh, famous for the stability uh, that they bring, and or at least this is how they have been seen in many corners of the EU. And, and he's the EPP uh, group, right? I mean, so the Conservative Party, so the EPP group. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the, and I think after such a long period of, uh, you know, stability co coupled with um, very centralized way of governing, uh, I have to say institutions have been really hollowed to a large extent by this way of, of governing, coupled with, uh, you know, spending uh, public money in not entirely uh, a transparent way. Um, and also playing this game with Russia on energy, with the US on defense and so on, has really been some sort of a model uh, for many in the West to say, okay, they're fine. I mean, they're probably corrupt, but aren't they all down there? And so, um, in a way, this is this is uh, the best we can get. And I think for the Bulgarian society, there was a moment to realize that th this could simply not go on like this anymore. And this moment arrived uh, at the beginning of last year. Um, successive parliaments could not um, create stable governments or could not create governments at all. And the last government uh, that was formed was a difficult coalition of four very diverse parties. From you know the left uh, with the socialists, uh, which are the former Communist Party, to the right with a kind of civic party uh, called uh, Yes Bulgaria. Um, in the middle, the liberally inclined newcomers of We Continue Change and the Prime Minister Petkov, but also a very peculiar party that some people would uh, compared to Cinque Stelle in, in Italy, to the Five Star Movement. Um, a bit of a black box, if I have to be honest. Um, populism coupled with nationalism, but also um, you're not quite sure where they lie on a bunch of things. And it turned out that actually this party um, had the backing of a couple of, uh, let's say, interests, uh, especially in infrastructure projects and so on. Um, and at the end of the day, it was the, the regional minister who basically blew the whole coalition up over, um, over uh, the infrastructure budget. So, <laughs> I would say there was a lot of symbolic politics involved. So they tried the Ukraine weapons, they tried the nationalistic card around the lifting the veto of North Macedonia, 
But at the end of the day, uh, behind that was actually, um, I think there were enough of those people who had realized that the Petkov government would not allow the deals to go on like this. Um, and so they decided it was a better choice to topple it rather than uh, to continue uh, model, modeling through. And so um, all in all, I think this election that is coming, uh, it frankly may not be the last one um, in this in this uh, short time span. It depends on how the balance of powers is going to be in the next parliament. But it is the result of this very fragmented uh, political space that we see in many other countries here as well, but also in this type of kind of populism, and I would say also uh, most probably Russian money uh, involved in, in those smaller parties, uh, like the one I was mentioning. But your point is that there's a pendulum here in a sense that we had a long phase of stability and one should not forget that. And then what we're seeing now is also a kind of response to that a long period of stability in, in exactly. Bulgaria. Yeah, that, that's an important point. I think point. political space just needs to settle. Yeah. There is yeah. still a lot of dust in the air, but eventually it will settle. Curiously enough, uh, Mr. Borisov is still around. Uh, yes. So maybe when one or two, you know, politicians uh, from the older times uh, would step back, that would also help for this dust to settle down. And the actual uh, war with uh, Vladimir Putin, what role did that play in the run-up uh, to, uh, to the election, if any at all? I remember that, was it the Minister of Defence? Did he have to resign when he used the same expression, not war, but special operation, as Vladimir yeah. Putin does? Enlighten us on that. He, he was just a symptom um, of, a, of a trend uh, that had started immediately with the war. Um, a trend in Bulgarian politics to say, oh, you know, there are two sides in this. Um, they're both, they're, they both have their fair share of, you know, uh, killed. Um, this is going to be a fast war. The Russians gonna, are going to win it. Um, and yes, the Minister of Defense at that time was calling it a special operation and was basically trying to keep people in some sort of a fearful kind of expectation that something terrible is going to happen to us. Um, this line of thought, I think, is very popular among um, all kind of people who have been under Russian influence for one or the other reason. Uh, I mean, political parties, I mean, media, and not only in Bulgaria, I mean, across the region. Um, the, the to divide societies and to say, look, at the end of the day, um, there are always two sides and at the end of the day we have to see our own interests and at mm. the end of the day it is not sure whether the West is going to our rescue if we have to rely on them. <clears throat> um, so it is a lot about also trust within the EU, within NATO um, and it is also about the effect of the Russian kind of propaganda and uh, I think social media in the past decade. And public opinion wise, would you say, what was then the attitude also over the summer? Uh, if you look upon the Bulgarian population with regards to the war? Um, I think still um, a lot of people say they're, the culprits uh, can be found also in Ukraine. Uh, but what is significant is that the approval rate of Putin, which was above 60% at the beginning of the war, dropped um, after the, fir the first month to uh, kind of uh, around 30. So mm -hmm. it, it dropped significantly. 
I assume it has been dropping even more ever since. Um, but still, you know, being so close to the war does not help, <clears throat> I think, um, being very, um, what should I say, very clear headed. You know, when you see something very close up, sometimes it blurs a bit. Yeah, one could make many comparisons got to that, but I'll skip that <laughs> right away. The energy situation. Tell me, I mean, when the conflict or when the war broke out, the percentage of uh, Bulgarian dependence upon Russia and gas was what? How high was that percentage? It was almost 100%. Almost 100%. And yes. energy in total? So The thing is that gas makes up for a very small portion of our energy mix. It's around 17%, 16.5 maybe. Um, but the rest is also not much better. I mean, the oil refinery, um, Luke Oil, um, is obviously primarily refining currently Russian oil. Uh, the nuclear power plant is also um, Russian made with nuclear fuel. And so we have indigenous coal um, and we have uh, quite, um, I mean, obviously developing renewable sector, um, but this has its volatilities, especially during the winter season. And so those 17% of gas are important in terms of social policy because they're used for some industries, but mainly for um, uh, utilities, for um, heating the big cities. Sofia. Uh, Sofia and others, yes. And so um, this is why politicians have been very worried about this whole gas story. At the same time, I have to say the moment the Petkov government decided, and Petkov himself decided to not only support the sanctions against Russia, but also to suggest some of those elements uh, himself. Uh, I think he knew quite well that this would produce uh, some sort of a backlash. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, Gazprom stopped its gas deliveries um, at the end of April, well, Bulgaria and Poland were the first two countries to cease to get uh, to cease getting Russian gas. Um, I think this was in a way almost expected. Um, and uh, for the rest, they they have also made some precautions. So all in you know, all, the energy situation is not. I would not describe it as dire. But it is very symptomatic for the um, for the Russian imprint um, in in this country, but also in many others. Uh, there are several countries who are in a similar situation, uh, both in terms of gas, and there are some who are even worse off in terms of oil. And uh, it also shows the leverage Russia can have. Uh, if it is to, you know, try and uh, destabilize the government, which they clearly did um, here. Yeah, because immediately after, I mean, just a couple of, I think it was a month ago, right? I mean, the uh, interim government uh, made the statement that it would try to get in contact with Gazprom and see whether you could buy new gas. So. What's happened with regards to that? I mean, if the situation is not dire, why would you embark upon such an endeavor? <clears throat> they do uh, they do need to get um, at least one uh, BCM for next year, and they do need to fill up the storages a bit more for this year. Um, and the fact is that the that the previous government had. Uh, a principled agreement with the US for the delivery of seven LNG loads, yep. um, which would have done the purpose. Um, the caretaker government, I think, had this illusion that 
Russia is going to like them more, and because of that, they would get the political bonus of getting some cheap gas back uh, online, which clearly did not happen, not because they did not try, <laughs> but I think because uh, uh, Mos for Moscow currently, the stakes are much higher. Obviously, the decision is to gradually stop the gas for, uh, for the EU, um, and this is not uh, going to change in any way. So the caretaker government unfortunately decided to take only one of those seven LNG loads. Um, so now they will have to basically go to, to the market and see uh, whether their, <laughs> whether their, uh, their new ways of, of getting additional gas. Of course, the problem is uh, that the demand is much higher than the supply currently. But also, uh, we do have, as I said, this neighborhood, which is quite complicated. Um, and uh, it turned out that um, the, 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 that one of the previous governments had really scrapped a contract with Azerbaijan over uh, an additional one BCM, which Petkov succeeded to reinstall, but also Borisov had created so many, so quickly, the Gazprom pipeline, which goes through Bulgaria, it's called Turkish Stream. Mm. It goes through Bulgaria up to Serbia and Hungary. That pipeline, however, does not have a single exit to the Bulgarian national gas system, which is remarkable. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so Turkish Stream, I think, is the big failure uh, of the EU in terms of, you know, trading stability for closing one eye on, on uh, strategic projects like, like this. Uh, and at the same time, the interconnector between Bulgaria and Greece, which was supposed to give access to alternative uh, routes, including LNG from the Greek ports, um, is, even, is still not built. Uh, it was started 12 years ago. Um, and so, and so the, the, what, what one succeeded to do is basically to push it to the finish line. And I think it will be functional any day uh, in October. So we're very close to getting this alternative. And hopefully this is going to make things also easier for whoever is in government next uh, in terms of access. But I'm, I'm just, I hope I did not bore your, your audience, but I, I just wanted to show how Gazprom and, and, and Russians, how effective they have been in, in basically, you know, outplaying the EU on something so obvious like Turkish Stream and the role of Turkish Stream was clearly to circumvent Ukraine, right? Mm. So that Gazprom has another route uh, to use uh, going towards Italy and towards um, Serbia and Hungary and Central Europe. Uh, and that happened, again, in a very fast pace, while the interconnector, which was the real energy diversification source, uh, was, was never built. So, um, th this, I think, shows, uh, if you ask me about the level of strategic penetration, how difficult that battle of ours is. I don't think you bored anyone. I don't think anybody can bore anyone with Gazprom these days. But not today, one will have to say. Also with, with Nord That's Stream. True. I mean, I'm in I'm in Berlin, but I mean, just looks, watching the news, obviously from from Bonholm and, and and Denmark as such. And um, before we get to the actual election, remember you can also ask questions. I'll make sure to to raise them. Um, this interim government, uh, who are they actually? And, and the role of the president is 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 very important. I yeah, understand. That's a very interesting question. The president, um, according to the constitution, after the parliament dissolves itself, has to uh, 
put up a caretaker government, which has no political legitimacy whatsoever, apart from the legitimacy that comes from the president himself, because there is no functioning parliament, these people have not been to an election. Uh, and um, it seems that they are trying to make uh, some long-term decisions uh, despite of this, which is problematic. So there have been quite a number of comments these days um, about correcting the constitution on, on, that, on, on the inst institution of the caretaker government in its own right. The president himself has been much more, um, let's say, Russia, mild vis-a-vis -vis Russia than any of the um, politicians in the coalition or for that matter uh, any of, of, the par of the parties in parliament, maybe with the exception of Vazrajdane, who are these Russophile nationalists, if you can imagine that combination. <laughs> I'm trying, okay. Um, and so, um, I think for Radev, this has become a role in its own right to be kind of the more uh, uh, anti, I, I would not say anti-Western, but anti-consensual type of uh, player, which I, I don't think really fits with his role according to the constitution, but there we are. And if we move to the election, um, the easy question will obviously be who wins, but I can already sort of sense that there will not be a, a clear majority sort of from what you already indicated. Maybe we'll have to have another uh, snap election at a certain stage. But if we now sort of take on our European glasses, we just had the Italian elections, very clear sort of what the main story was there, Meloni and the rise of populism and so forth. What do you think would be sort of the European sort of message uh, from the election on, on, on Sunday from Sofia? I think the most important um, outcome will be whether we will have a government or not. Uh, if we have a stable government, um, this is already uh, going to be, to be important, especially in, in times like this. What I what I'm really uh, surprised by is that, for instance, this nationalist uh, Russophile uh, guy and his party, they're of course anti-vaxxers and so on, um, the, all of them have openly started to advocate for exiting NATO and EU. This was a no-go before. Um, and even though we may look at them as a fringe party and so on, I think the fact that this has entered the discourse uh, in Europe is not good. Um, so I would say the message from the elections would be, do we have our parliamentary system working? Meaning, can it produce a, a government? This would already be, I think, a good result. Uh, and But secondly, uh, what are the implications on the rule of law reforms? And I think rule of law, uh, the anti-corruption drive and so on, is going to remain the main, um, you know, goal one should, one should look at. And uh, especially vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the Hungarian and the Polish uh, uh, mm -hmm. cases, it, it is going to be important to have uh, really some sort of a reformist uh, majority that can make um, those reforms happen. And any risk that this election will somehow put the uh, common line with regards to sanctions against Russia in jeopardy or weapons delivery? Any risk of that? I don't or think so. I don't think uh, that currently anybody would really risk uh, putting, um, you know, obstacles uh, uh, in the European consensus. I 
frankly don't even think that Italy is going to dare do that. But uh, um, I don't see this happening. I just feel that um, there will be, if things don't go very well, there would be an introverted period in, in our politics whereby the European agenda will be less and less uh, visible and less and less uh, important. And this kind of anti-Western propaganda, or let's say skepticism vis-a-vis -vis how much we can trust each other um, uh, may, may unfortunately grow. So, it, it, yeah, this is very important in that sense, how the war for the hearts and minds is going to look like um, in this coming year. And any demonstrations in uh, in Sofia uh, with regards to the high energy prices? I mean, here in Germany, well, you don't have that many, but you have to, but you still you have demonstrations. You even had demonstrations that you should open Nord Stream 2 in Lubni. Uh, that was uh, yesterday. Uh, that's going to be a bit difficult now. But any demonstrations, any sort of uh, talk of uh, on, on sort of uh, unrest in the streets and so forth. As you I know, don't countries. see this for now uh, because in uh, what the government has done was to compensate households uh, and keep their electricity bills pretty much uh, um, in a ma at a manageable level. Um, people, however, are worried about inflation. Inflation here is at 17 percent already which is very high and uh, you know the less uh, rich people are the more the effects of inflation are, are felt and so I think uh, of course the countries which are much worse off than us in the neighborhood but this is not going to be an easy winter so I think for the whoever comes in government it will be important to keep um, kind of the public on board in terms of uh, economy, um, energy reforms, and so on. And there, the interim government, uh, if there is no government, I guess the interim government will continue, or another one, then they yes. will have to solve this overall uh, situation. Yes, then exactly. Yeah. Which again, the president will be like, in yeah. the absence of parliament. So yeah. I think that this is also one reason why. Uh, I, I really hope that uh, the president also decides against him being the the sole o owner of this crisis, to put mm. it this way. Good, let's open for the questions. I have uh, one here from Matthias Irming Sonne, who he must be close where I am, if he's in Berlin usually at least, uh, for a Danish uh, newspaper, Information. He asked you about sort of the Bulgarian discussion on the geopolitical turn in EU. So it sounds almost like the strategic autonomy discussion within ECFR, I presume, about defense, trade and industry. So what's the debate like in, in Bulgaria on these issues, if you have any, obviously, I should also ask, because in Denmark, we don't have a huge debate on that, except during, obviously, the, uh, the referendum that we had on the defense dimension. But over to you. We don't have a big def uh, debate on that either, um, but I think um, looking at the region, if you allow me, it has become less and less uh, possible to simply sit on the fence. And I think um, whoever is in government realizes that um, they will have to really have a say in how this uh, uh, geopolitical turn will look like. Because, um, for instance, looking at, looking at uh, Serbia, um, there has, I mean, they have been really playing this pick and choose game for a long time. I don't think this is possible anymore. And in the same uh, way, even more for a country like Bulgaria, which is in the EU and in NATO. Um, the, the centrifugal forces uh, uh, are, are strong enough, so it has to be really aware that it has to to, to have an active role. But I, I cannot uh, say that there is a huge debate on that. Maybe one thing is this whole idea about energy security, common purchasing uh, of, of gas, and the fact that European solidarity 
has to be um, demonstrated in crisis like that, uh, which many politicians in Germany and elsewhere don't and, and don't want to hear. Um, the fact that, uh, especially for smaller ones, this is um, uh, an equation which is difficult to solve, given the limited demand and, and what the limited supply. So, yeah, and what about uh, what about immigration? I mean, is that turning into an issue? I remember when I was in in Bulgaria. I mean, the big issue at that time was also, I guess, it still is the shrinking population of uh, yeah. of Bulgaria. I mean, we do have uh, quite a number of Ukrainians currently here. We had almost two hundred thousand entering Bulgaria and almost half of them staying, which is a very high number, uh, much higher than, um, uh, uh, let's say, Romania in terms of the ratio of those who come in and who stay. Um, they gave them, uh, while the season had not started, they had given them rooms in the hotels at the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. So for all these women and children, it was really a good thing to get away from <laughs> the war for a couple of months. Some of them have came back uh, to Kiev now because and to other places now because uh, the war has been concentrated in the eastern part um, of the country, but um, um, some of them stayed and, and I think this is a great experience also for the Bulgarian society to be more welcoming, to be more open, to get uh, you know, uh, new minds, uh, new energy. We have to, however, also understand that all those things are, are expensive. And for us, this has been also a bit of a struggle, getting the commission to understand that some systems uh, like healthcare and education could collapse uh, under the weight of, uh, of those people. So coming in, so it has been a bit, um, uh, a bit of a climb uh, to get there. But I think ov overall, the migration debate is still to come. Um, and we have to also be aware that um, if we talk about food crisis, food shortages, energy uh, prices, and so on, many people from Africa and elsewhere uh, may try to uh, come to Europe again. Uh, this is not the migration crisis from 2015, that this may be a, a much bigger one. Would you allow me to take also this ad, this second question by Matthias? Sure, I, could, I, I just couldn't see it. <laughs> That's why on the Italian election. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. I can't see it. Go ahead. You're more professional. I line. think this is a very interesting question because um, um, Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union address said um, this is, you know, a crisis that we could not foresee because we didn't listen to the Eastern Europeans. Mm. The Eastern Europeans have been telling us and we thought this was, you know, warmongering and we didn't pay attention to them. And many people in Eastern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe feel now vindicated in a weird, weird way by, by Putin's war in Ukraine. But at the same time, when Brussels tells us you should not allow, you Italy should not allow fascists on, on the government, many people here say, why would they tell us what to think? You know, this is Vox Populi, Vox Dei. Um, we cannot... Um, you know, stop the Italians from choosing their own government. And I think this is a bit of battle or, or let's say an argument of uh, prejudices. We all have our kind of mindsets. Uh, we're much more here, we're much more kind of sensitive towards, uh, you know, KGB and uh, Soviet ambitions and we know how those look like and what they can lead to. Um, and others in, in Western Europe are much more sensitive to 
to you know this mixture of nationalism and populism that can really create fascist movements. Um, and and I think there is still a need to discuss those our you know our uh, mindsets and our prejudices with each other among uh, among the EU member states because um, I think this will make us stronger also as a union to understand that you know there are warning signs. Uh, that others see and that we also may have to take seriously. And talking about the Italian election, there was a very low turnout, at least for Italian standards. Any ideas on the turnout in the Bulgarian election? It's going to be low. Uh, What's low? Uh, well, you know, if it's if it's above 50 percent, it will be OK still. Uh, so it may even go lower. With every next election, you know, it can, it it's gonna become uh, lower and lower. This is one second. We have the the voters lists uh, that keep all these Bulgarians who live abroad uh, on the lists, uh -huh. and there are like two million of them um, in the meantime. And so, turnout turnout is a bit of a it, it, it does not reflect entirely the people who, have, who are in the country and live in the country, whom, whom they, you know, how many of them turn out. Okay. So um, this is why I do not really pay that much attention to that number, but it, of course, is going to get to go down the more elections we have in a short uh, span of time. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, four minutes we have uh, as sort of a sneak preview on your on your election night, so to speak. What will you be looking out for and what should we sort of look out for? I mean, how big various, I mean, which parties do you think will be maybe the talk of the town in in the EU bubble on uh, on Monday? We will definitely have GERP and we will definitely have so, the continued yeah. change. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we will have, again, Da Bulgaria, yes, Bulgaria. We will have the Turkish party, uh, who are um, probably in best terms with GERB. So I think the coalitions that are very possible are probably GERB with the Turks or we continue change with uh, DB. Um, and then the question is how many smaller parties are going to come in? The socialists say they, they would go with, uh, with uh, the change and with uh, Debe. But then you have all sorts of like the nationalists and the party of this former uh, Minister of Defense who, mm -hmm. who said it was a, a military operation. Um, so and then this quasi Cinque Stelle part, I mean, all of them, whether they're going to enter again the parliament or not, I think this is going to be very decisive. So I would say if you see there are five or six parties, it's a good story. <laughs> if you see there are eight or nine parties, it's not that great. And what's the threshold? It's four percent. OK, so we should definitely look out, look out for, I mean, how many parties make it into make it into parliament. Exactly. And we should possibly also remember that you could have another interim government and then look out for, for the president one more time. So that was exactly. Uh, so that would be that would be the other option, which obviously is not ideal, given that we're at war. Excellent. Well, uh, you made us a lot wiser. That was not that difficult, I guess, because the knowledge uh, at least I'm talking about the Danes on this call, there are probably also other nationalities. It's not as if we, we hear that much about Bulgarian policy, but but that was really great, particularly also the point about the pendulum and also just, I mean, highlighting the, the, the fact that you are in a completely different corner of Europe than we are. And obviously that also has an impact and also your history with regards to, to also relationship with Russia. So that was really enlightening. You mentioned, by the way, the food crisis. And I can say that will be the next webinar that we are doing. That will be on the 9th of November. It's the 
webinar is called Fighting Famine. So uh, go and check out our website for that one on the 9th of November. It has nothing to do with the fall of the Berlin Wall, but we just chose that date because that was the one that was possible. We will also put this uh, webinar out on our various so social platforms, so if you can recommend it to others uh, who want to have their crash course on the Bulgarian election before it takes place this Sunday. So thank you very much, Vesla. It was a great pleasure uh, talking to you and also thanks to all of you who participated and also thank you to Matthias for coming out with the two questions, although I could only read one of them, but now I actually saw the second one. So thank you very much and uh, stay safe and see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.